Hmm. Hello everybody. Welcome to this lecture number one on classical mechanics. Our topic today will be Lagrangians and Hamilton's equation. This is um, a review of what we did in class before we went for holiday. And also I shall also introduce some new things. So welcome to this lecture. Our lecture today will be divided into four main areas. First, we will do an introduction on classical mechanics. We will look at basically the understanding of what classical mechanics is. Then we will define what we call the generalized coordinates and degrees of freedom. Then we look at what we call constraints and there are two types. We have holonomic constraints and non-holonomic constraints. We shall see difference between these two. Then we shall look at what we call the generalized force and the kinetic energy. And after that, we will use the generalized force and kinetic energy to derive the Lagrangian equation. So basically, this lecture today is focused on the Lagrangian equation. Once we shall have the Lagrangian equation, we, shall, we will try to see how it is applied in um, simple mechanical systems such as a pendulum or a mass on a spring. And then in our next lecture, we shall look at now application of Lagrangian equation into more complex uh, mechanical systems. So I hope we shall follow through. So in our introduction, classical mechanics is divided into two main groups. We have the Newtonian mechanics, or what we call the Newtonian approach, on one hand, and then we also have the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian approach on the other hand. So the main difference between these two approaches first is that in Newtonian mechanics, we develop um, the, the forces present in a system and we use the forces to get the equation of motion. For instance, the main equation in Newtonian approach is uh, the second law, which is F is equals to MA, or simply the rate of change of momentum is equal to force. So this Newtonian approach applies for both linear systems, like we can see here, linear systems and uh, uh, the rotational systems. So here, the main thing is that we use forces or torque to develop the equations of motion. In Lagrangian and Hamiltonian approach, instead of using forces, we use the kinetic energies. We use both the kinetic energy and the potential energy in a system to develop the equations of motion. So these two approaches um, produce the same result. The only, the only difference will come Newtonian approach cannot be applied on simple systems. When a system is a bit complicated with a lot of constraints, then we cannot apply the Newtonian approach. But Lagrangian approach can be applied both for simple systems and complicated systems. So the main focus when you are working on the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian approach is to get these variables here, L, which is called the Lagrangian, and H, which is called the Hamiltonian. Okay, so the main focus will be to find these two, L and H. Now, in any system, we use coordinates. The main coordinate that we are all familiar with is what we call the Cartesian coordinates. And the Cartesian coordinates is basically the x, y, and z. Then we also have other coordinates, like we have polar coordinates, we have cylindrical coordinates, and we have the sp spherical coordinates. So in order to, for example, convert from um, Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates, you can basically use a diagram like you can see here to convert, okay, or transform 
from one system of coordinates to another. So the equations that we have here are called transformation equations because they transform the x into, in terms of r, theta, and phi. So in other words, it transforms Cartesian to spherical. Similarly, y can be converted in, into spherical coordinates by this expression here. And that goes to the z also, can be transformed from z to, in terms of r and theta. So the Cartesian coordinates can be converted to cylindrical coordinates. It can be converted to polar coordinates, can be converted to spherical coordinates. It just depends on uh, the preference that you decide to take. Okay, so therefore this means that um, when you have a particle that is simply moving in space, then that particle can be specified using three coordinates, all right? That particle can be specified using three coordinates. These three coordinates can be x, y, z. It can be r, theta, phi. It can be r, theta, z, or whatever coordinates. But basically, a particle can be defined or specified using three coordinates. Now, if there are two particles, then the two particles can be specified using six coordinates because one particle will be specified in three coordinates the other one will be specified in three coordinates and if there are three particles then of course it is nine coordinates if there are four particles it is uh, 12 coordinates and so on so what we are saying is that for a system of n particles we need three n coordinates to specify completely the simultaneous positions of all the particles or configuration of the system. So if you can define positions of all particles in a system, then we are saying you have described the system. The system is described by the particles. So for n particles, you have three n coordinates. So we also have uh, what we call the generalized coordinates. And the generalized coordinates can be... So we are saying that generalized coordinates can be Cartesian coordinates, spherical coordinates, or cylindrical coordinates. Whatever coordinates somebody decides to use, those are referred to as generalized coordinates. For instance, if a particle is constrained to move in a plane or a surface, then only two coordinates are needed to specify the particle's position. Now, if the particle moves in a straight line or a fixed curve, then one coordinate is sufficient. So I hope you can see that when we say surface, we use two coordinates. When we say a line, we use one coordinate. If constraints are imposed on the system, the number of coordinates actually needed to specify the configuration is reduced, okay? For example, if we have a particle that can move in space, then a single, that single particle is described using three coordinates, all right? If we say that the particle should only move in a surface, the particle should only move in a surface such that the z the z coordinate is zero then z coordinate when we say z is equal to zero that is called a constraint it is a condition imposed on the particle so that it cannot move in the z direction so in that case because you have one equation of constraint then the particle can be described using three minus one okay initially the particle could move in space, three coordinates. You subtract the constraints, that is one, so you have only two, all right? So the number of constraints reduce the number of coordinates. So if there are n particles, you describe the coordinates with three n coordinates. If you have m equations of constraints, 
then the number of degrees of freedom is reduced. So we say it is 3n minus m. Let me just uh, revisit what I've said here. If a particle can be specified in space without any constraints, then we say it has three degrees of freedom because it has three coordinates. If a particle can move in, sp in a fixed surface, then it has two degrees of freedom because we only need two coordinates. If a particle can move in a straight line or a curve, then it has only one degree of freedom. So that's why we're saying in general that the number of degrees of freedom is the total number of coordinates required to describe the system. You subtract the conditions imposed or the constraints so that the equation becomes n is equals to 3n minus m, where m is number of coordinates. <laughs> so, uh, in general, these general coordinates, whether they are Cartesian, uh, um, cylindrical, or spherical, are called generalized coordinates. And we use the symbols Q for the generalized coordinates. So if it is one particle in space, then we only have Q1, Q2, Q3, basically for X, Y, Z. If there are two particles, in space, then we shall have Q1 up to Q6. If there are 20, of course it will be 20 times three. That will be 60. So we'll have 60 generalized coordinates. That's why we're saying in general that um, the coordinates range from Q1 up to Qn, where N refers to the number of degrees of freedom after all constraints have been removed. So in other words, what we are trying to say is that um, if you have, if you have um, four degrees of freedom, then the four degrees of freedom can be specified with generalized coordinates, Q1, Q2, up to Q4 times three, that is Q12 and so on. Those are called generalized coordinates. So we normally use the symbol Q with subscript K, where K ranges from one to N. N is the total number of degrees of freedom, okay? So we can define degrees of freedom as the number of independent ways in which particles can move in a system without violating any constraint imposed on the system, okay? So apart from knowing that uh, degrees of freedom N is three times capital N minus M, we can define it as number of independent ways used to describe a system without violating any constraint. That will give you what we call the degrees of, of degrees of freedom. So if for a simple particle, the Cartesian coordinates are expressible as a function of generalized coordinates, like we have said, if a particle moves in a curve or simply a line, then only one coordinate is required, that is Q. So this Q could be maybe theta or R or whichever other system, but it is simply one coordinate. So the Cartesian coordinate can be expressed in terms of the other coordinate, uh, if a particle is moving on a curve. Similarly, if a particle is moving on a surface, then the Cartesian coordinates can be expressed in terms of two other coordinates, spherical or cylindrical or whatever, Q1 and Q2. Remember here we are talking about a particle. Similarly, we have Y coordinate is expressible in terms of the other coordinate Q1 and Q2. This is for a surface. If a particle is moving, if a particle is moving in space, then of course you have the X, Y, Z, a Cartesian coordinates, which can be transformed to other coordinate systems. So those other coordinate systems uh, will be probably R, Q, 
theta phi okay so x can be transformed to that coordinate equally we have y can be transformed to other coordinate and z the same the bottom line is for a curve we only have one coordinate for a surface, a particle on a surface, you have two coordinates, two degrees of freedom. For a particle in space, you have three coordinates, three degrees of freedom. Okay, that's what we, how we relate the degrees of freedom and the transformation equations. So in this slide, we have an, an illustration. Um, a particle moving freely in space requires three coordinates, e.g. x, y, z to specify its position. Therefore, the number of degrees of freedom is three. If a system of particle has n particles moving freely in space, then we require three n coordinates to specify its position. I think we have also discussed that. So therefore we can say that the number of degrees of freedom is three n. So here it is three n because we do not have any constraint in the system. I think these two are self-explanatory. So um, holonomic constraints. First, ho constraints are simply limitations on the motion of a particle or basically conditions imposed on a particle. They are generally referred to as constraints. So we have two types of constraints. The first one is the holonomic constraints. Now, holonomic constraints are those that can be expressed as an equation, an equation that has a um, that is a function of the generalized coordinates. Okay, so basically, the main thing is that uh, uh, those conditions can be expressed in an equation form. Then you can simply call them holonomic constraints. For example, you can have a cylinder rolling without slipping on a rough inclined plane uh, that has an angle alpha. That can be a holonomic constraint. Uh, you can have a horizontal cylinder rolling inside another horizontal cylinder. So because the path taken by the center of the cylinder is defined or can be expressed as an equation, then that becomes a holonomic constraint. Similarly, you can have a particle that moves in a line uh, that is influenced by a force, okay? So the fact that you can write the condition imposed in form of an equation uh, gives or identifies that constraint as holonomic. For example, we can look at a video here. Mm, video is opening. Mm. Okay. Let's uh, uh, taking a bit of time. Okay. Uh, I think maybe the video has a has an issue, but basically, holonomic constraints are those can be expressed into this form. So let's look at the next uh, type of constraint. Oh, the video is... Uh... Video is taking too long. Yeah, here we go. So, in, in this video, you can see a particle describing or moving in a particular path, which is circular. So, uh, yeah, a path which is circular. So because the path of the particle is defined with, as an equation, which is equation of a circle, uh, informs us this is a holonomic constraint, all right? So the equation of a circle is a constraint uh, 
which is called holonomic. And same to others, as long as you can express them as an equation uh, that can be differentiated or integrated, then it becomes holonomic. All right, so let's uh, move to the next one. For the other type of constraint, known as non-holonomic constraint, it's the exact opposite of the holonomic constraint, meaning that any equation that cannot be expressed in this form is regarded as a non-holonomic. In other words, the equation cannot be expressed as um, with an, an, an equal sign, but inequalities are used instead, all right? Um, such equations are also not integrable or cannot be differentiated. So non-holonomic constraints are those that cannot be expressed in a form that has an equal sign, but instead we can use inequalities and such equations cannot be integrated or differentiated. For example, when you have a sphere that is a constraint to roll on a perfectly rough plane. Obviously when a sphere is rolling on a, on, on a surface, uh, it, it moves in a path that is not uh, well defined in a specific equation. Okay, so that becomes non-holonomic. A sphere rolling down um, from the top of a fixed sphere is also non-holonomic because at some point it will leave the sphere and it will just drop down. A cylinder rolling and possibly sliding, all right? So you see here we have rolling and we have sliding. So that means uh, even writing the equation is not, um, you cannot write a single equation with an equal sign because you have the rolling and sliding, okay, at the same time. Uh, down on an inclined plane at an angle alpha. And of course, we have said a sphere rolling down another sphere. Yes, obviously, because the sphere that is rolling on top of the other one will leave the, the other sphere and it will fall down. So when you want to distinguish between holonomic and non-holonomic constraint, first of all, you look at the nature of the equation describing the constraint. If it can be expressed in terms of an equal sign, then it and the equation can be integrated or differentiated, then it becomes holonomic, all right? If the equation or if the expression cannot be written with an, equi with an equation or with an equal sign, uh, then it is non-holonomic. In such case, we use inequalities and such uh, constraints cannot be integrated. All right, so let's move to the next one. So in this slide here, I want to show you how the notations, I mean the notations that are used in uh, classical mechanics. So first of all, we have already dis uh, discussed the generalized coordinates that is Q1, Q2 up to Qn, where N refers to the number of degrees of freedom. And if you have two particles, then it is of course uh, two times three minus the constraints available. So Qs are used to describe the generalized coordinates. We have also said that uh, the Cartesian coordinates can be expressed in terms of other coordinates. And similarly, other coordinates can be expressed in terms of uh, the Cartesian coordinates. So for instance, if we have an equation, this one is an equation, all right? It describes an equation that is a function of the generalized coordinates. Um, if it is in this form, it means this equation is differentiable, all right? So that a small change in x, which is delta x, is expressed as a partial derivative of x with respect to the first generalized coordinate multiplied by the small change in the first uh, generalized coordinate, then plus the partial derivative of x with respect to the second uh, generalized coordinate multiplied by the small change in that coordinate, then plus the next um, generalized coordinate until all of them are differentiated, all right? So these are partial derivatives. These are partial derivatives of x with respect to each of the generalized coordinates in 
the equation that you have. Similarly, if you have y, it can be expressed in terms of other coordinates and you can differentiate that expression with respect to each generalized coordinate in this equation. And that is what you can see here. So this exp this, uh, these two expressions, the delta x and delta y, can be written in one solid form, uh, as the summation form, as we shall see later. Mm, yeah. So in this, uh, just a minute, I think I've clicked twice. Yeah, so uh, we have a specific example here for polar coordinates. We know that polar coordinates uh, represent uh, the position of a particle in terms of the radius r and an angle theta, like you can see here. So you have two axes, you have x and y, and you have the point, uh, a particle at this point, which can be expressed in terms of r and theta. So obviously, if, if we use trigonometric ratios here, then we can write x in terms of r and theta, and we can also write y in terms of r and theta. So that is what you see here. If you look at this triangle here, if you consider this triangle, then you can see that x is equal to r sine of theta, and this uh, opposite side of uh, theta um, gives you uh, r cosine theta. So this is uh, like, for example, you, we have transformed the Cartesian coordinate into the, the, the polar coordinate for x and y. Mm. Okay, I think here, this one should be reversed. It should be r cos theta and y should be r sine theta. You basically follow the triangle. Maybe that one, uh, we, can, we, can, we can change this. So now that we have said, we have looked at the notation of um, a Cartesian transformation equation, we can then write this one here as delta x equal to partial x partial r times delta r plus partial x partial delta theta uh, multiplied by delta theta, the same to y. So I'm basically following these two, this, this expression and this expression. So here, we only have two coordinates, two generalized coordinates. I'm calling them Q1 is R and Q2 is theta. And that is what you can see here. So this one can be written in a derivative form as this and also as this one for Y. Okay. So in general, what we have said, the, the expression that I showed you earlier is that it can be written in a compact form using the sigma notation. So if you have uh, n degrees of freedom, then we have k ranging from 1 to n. And then we have partial x uh, over partial qk, where q could be 1, then it moves to 2, 3, until it gets to n, and then multiplied by delta of from q1 to qn. So this is the compact form of what we have uh, seen in the previous slide. So for X coordinate appears like that, for Y coordinate appears like that, for Z coordinate appears like that. So if you have only one particle in, a, in the system, then you only have here delta X1. That's, that means you only have one single particle. If you have two, then of course you'll have a summation of uh, the first particle and then the second particle, which we can see, we will see later. So um, let's look at now what we call the generalized force, how to uh, derive it. First, a particle undergoes a displacement delta R under a force F. So the work done or the element of work in that case is delta W. That means the small element of work. So it is force that is acting on that particular particle multiplied by the small displacement in that particle. So we all know that work done is force times distance or displacement. So that's what we have. So uh, small change in work is force times delta R. 
delta r, uh, if it is in space, then it has three components. That is delta x, del uh, delta y, delta z. And then of course, fx is the force acting in the x direction. Fy is a force acting in the y direction. Fz is a force acting in the z direction. So you have you have the work done on the particle being split into three main components. That is the x, y, and z. So then we can also write this expression. Instead of using x, y, z, we can use x1, x2, and x3, where one stands for x direction, two stands for y direction, and three stands for z direction. The same applies to f1, f2, and f3. So this expression can again be expressed in a compact form We're using the sigma notation like this. So we have fi, that simply means if you are dealing with one particle in a space, then I ranges from one to three, that is X, Y to Z. And of course, the um, if it is in space, then you have X, Y, and Z. So again, delta X, I uh, ranges from one to three. So this is just the same as saying uh, delta X plus delta Y plus delta Z. But now we are using the notation I to stand for those three um, directions. So um, the delta X notation is expressed in a compact form like this. I think we have seen this. So the next thing we need to do is this small element of work delta W, we want to substitute this delta XI into this expression here. So that we write a small element of work delta W in terms of the sigma notation of the um, generalized, I mean, the degrees of freedom and also the, the, the dimensions of the space. So like we have said, now this is delta W, a small element of work. What if we substitute the delta XI, then this equation, equation, the expression will look like this with the two sigma notation. The sigma notation I, remember, stands for X, Y, Z, the three dimensions. While the K notation now identifies the number of generalized coordinates, okay? Remember, like I said, if there are two particles uh, in moving in space, then you'll definitely have six of them. So K will range from one to six. And obviously I, if it is in space, will range from one to so the small element of work can be written in two sigma notations as what you can see here, which we can rewrite properly so that we, we kind of collect like terms and then we, uh, we see what appears in that bracket. For example, if we put the i's together, you can see this is fi, this is delta, this is partial xi, and then qk. And then the sigma notation K, we now put the delta, the sigma notation um, on the outside, kind of we, we factorize. The reason for doing this is so that this thing that appears inside this big bracket, all right, we can actually see that it, 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 it looks like a force. Remember, this is work done. If this is work done and this is delta, Q, that is like distance. So whatever appears um, as a coefficient of displacement is a force. So this term inside the bracket here is expressed as capital QK and is known as the generalized force. Okay, I hope you can simply move from here to this stage so that you factorize the this fi partial xi and then you 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 factorize sigma qk and you see that whatever is inside the bracket uh, can be denoted as q capital qk and is known as a generalized force then we also need to remember 
that for a conservative system, and I'm, I'm sure we, we, are, we are all aware of what conservative systems are, the force that acts on a particle can be expressed as a derivative of some scalar potential. That scalar potential is denoted as V, and it is equivalent to the potential energy. In other words, we say that force is a partial derivative of the potential energy with respect to the displacement. Okay, this is for a conservative system. So if that is the case, if we look at um, QK, okay, QK is here. We have um, QK is a summation of FI partial XI over delta QK. Then we substitute FI. We simply substitute FI with this one here, partial derivative of potential energy we will end up with this expression that is boxed here. So this is how you, expressed, you express the generalized force. This is the generalized force. You can see here, it is a function of the generalized coordinates. The generalized force is a function of the generalized coordinates. Okay, so I hope you remember this because we'll need it to derive the Lagrangian. So we also know that kinetic energy of a particle is uh, a half times mass times the velocity squared. And so if you have a particle moving in space, then the velocity will have three components. That is the X component, the Y component, and the Z component. X dot simply means the velocity in the X direction. And the same applies to y dot, the velocity in the y direction, and so on. So this is kinetic energy for n particles, okay? Moving from particle one to the last particle n, this is the kinetic energy. So instead of writing it uh, in several components, we can again avoid using y and z and simply use uh, x. So you see here, we had n particles, but inside the bracket, we had X, Y, Z. Similarly, I mean, we can avoid using X, Y, Z and simply use X, but then the total number of coordinates will be 3N because each of the particle will have X, Y, Z. So the kinetic energy can be written in a compact form as what you can see here. Then we note that X, I is a generalized coordinate which um, contains all the coordinates, maybe cylindrical, spherical, like we said earlier. And this one can be broken down. Um, first of all, before I come to this expression of delta, here, Xi is a coordinate that um, is a function of coordinates Qi, I mean Q1 to Qn, and it's also a function of time. That's very important. It is also a function of time. That means we can differentiate x to obtain velocity. Because for us to obtain velocity, you differentiate the displacement with respect to time. So these coordinates here, x, y, z, are also functions of time. So you can differentiate them with respect to time. So the delta x for the first part of Q1 to Qn, it's expressed as a compact form like this, the first sigma notation here. And then plus a term that has only t. You differentiate now x as a, as, with respect to time, delta t. And this is what you have. So the first part has a sigma notation. It sums all the independent coordinates from one to n. And then we also differentiate the same x with respect to time. And this is what you have. So then uh, we can as well divide this expression by delta t. So you divide here, this is what you get. You divide here by delta t, this is what you get. You divide here by delta t, this is what you get, but of course this will cancel. So if you do that, 
let me just go back a little. This expression here, the derivative of x with respect to time is simply written as x dot. So this one will turn to x dot. And this term here will, will turn to one, all right? So this one has turned to x dot. The, the same here, delta q over delta t will turn to q dot. Anything differentiated with respect to time turns to that coordinate then with a dot. So that is what we get after doing that. And therefore, it can be expanded in this fashion, which uh, you can express this one in from one to n, as you can see the first part here, and then the last part remains as it is. So then, when you, where do we differentiate this with respect to uh, q? We can, remember these are partial derivatives. So when we differentiate this expression with respect to q dot, q1 dot, all the other general coordinates are considered as constants. So when you differentiate this with respect to q1 dot, you simply obtain uh, delta x, sorry, partial xi over partial q1, okay? If you do the same, if you differentiate this with respect to q dot 2 or q2 dot, then all the other from Q1, Q3, and so on are considered constants. So this is what you get when you differentiate this expression with respect to all the velocities, okay? So in general, what we are saying is that uh, instead of just having uh, one, two, three, and four, we can simply put it in general form as partial xi dot partial qik is equal to xi dot partial xi over partial qk. This has simply come from this expression. If you decide to multiply both sides by um, delta xi dot, you are not changing anything, but you are maintaining the equation the same. You are not changing the equation. So once you understand that you, differenti you differentiate the expression with respect to each uh, generalized coordinate, then this is what you get. And generally, you can write it in terms of k so that you avoid writing one, two, three, and so on. So um, uh, from the expression that we have just had, let me just go back a bit here. From this expression, I want to differentiate both sides with respect to time. So I differentiate the left-hand side with respect to time, and I differentiate the right-hand side with respect to time. So when I do that, the left-hand side, d dt, means this is supposed to be differentiated with respect to time. On the right-hand side, okay, this is the part that uh, I, I, I should explain properly. The left-hand side, we have simply expressed that d dt, of the left hand side is this, but the right hand side, we have written DDT and differentiated it. So let me go back to previous slide and explain how to differentiate that. So here, if we want to differentiate this with respect to time, all we need to do first is to realize that we have two functions. We have this function here, okay, which is a function of time. Then we have also this function here, which is a function of time. So because we are differentiating two functions, we use the product rule. According to product rule, you differentiate this, you keep this one constant. Then you differentiate this and you keep this one constant. So this side will give you two terms, okay? You differentiate this, keep this one constant. You differentiate this, you keep this one constant. And that is what has been that's what has been done here. You have two terms. The first term, we have differentiated x dot to give us this, and we have kept this one constant. Plus, we have kept xi dot constant, but we have differentiated this. So now you see there's a new dot with respect to time. So this one, we have used the 
product tool to differentiate the right hand side and the left hand side we have simply uh, noted it with d dt so once that is done we can multiply the two sides by mi okay we are doing this so that we can get an expression for force because force is mass times acceleration so let's multiply if you bring here mi this is what you get okay this one we shall explain how it comes uh, if you multiply here by m here you multiply here by m you will get force fi you multiply here by m okay mi still remains but i need to i need to make you understand here that it you can rewrite this expression here this one here so that it be you write it in terms of squared this one is a is a is a is a is, has come due to differentiation by product rule uh, i want you to try and see how this term has come about this term is inside the bracket where you have x dot squared over 2 if you can understand this part okay i can show you if you have difficulty you can let me know i will we shall ex exchange ideas and see how this one comes about so we have multiplied by mi and the equation has turned into this form then next step we simply rearrange we rearrange it so that we have an expression that we all know that is half mv squared so this one will become kinetic energy. The right hand side, there's nothing much on the first term, but the second term, we can again rewrite this so that it comes as half mv squared. So this is kinetic energy, this is kinetic energy. So let's see what happens in the next term. So the kinetic energies, I have decided to put them in red. Okay. And this term in blue here, it is also familiar because we have already explained the generalized force. So this is the generalized force. The reds are the kinetic energies. So then we need to note the kinetic energy with letter T. And we need to substitute the generalized coordinate with the, its symbol QK. So this long equation turns to be something small and reduced that takes this form where the kinetic energy has been substituted with t and the generalized force has been substituted with q so then we are now inching closer to the lagrange's equation of motion so let's see how this t will 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 turn we also need to recall that for a conservative system the generalized force is a partial derivative of the potential energy with a negative. So from that equation that we have seen in the previous slide, we have the first term on the left. This is the, the, the generalized, um, no, no, no. Let me go back. This term remains, this one remains. So we substitute QK. Remember QK has a minus. So if it has a minus, we can write it on the right hand extreme right. And this is what we have done here. This term here is QK. This is the one that is maintained from the previous equation. So that is what we get. Now we have an equation that has kinetic energy T and potential energy V. Potential energy is a function of position only. Kinetic energy is a function of velocity time, okay? So from here, you can factorize and you see partial over partial QK is common. So you only have T minus V inside the bracket. So this T minus V is very important at this stage. We call it the Lagrangian function of the system. So the Lagrangian function is expressed with this curly L, okay? It's not a normal L, 
it's a L written with a curly top. It's simply total kinetic energy minus total potential energy. This is what we call the Lagrangian function. So we can replace T minus V with L, the Lagrangian function. So that we put the right, left hand side is D D T of partial T over partial Q dot is equals to partial L over partial QK. So we are still moving closer. We have now T on the left and we have L on the right. We want to have an, a, a, a single equation that has L and L. So let's see what happens next. So for a system with the kinetic energy as function of velocities, and potential energy as function of positions, we can simply see that if you differentiate potential energy with, veloc with respect to velocity, that gives you zero. Because potential energy is not a function of velocity. This is what is, we can see here. Now, if you differentiate the potential, the kinetic energy with respect to velocity, uh, if this is zero, dv dq dot is zero. Okay, let me go back to the previous slide so that you see how I substitute this term here, this one. Okay. Uh, now, if we, um, uh, no, not that one. So the uh, potential energy is not a function of velocity. And so <clears throat> if we differentiate it with velocity, we get zero. Okay. On the other hand, if we differentiate kinetic energy with respect to velocity, it is the same as differentiating the Lagrangian with respect to velocity because the, the partial V partial Q dot is zero. Okay, so the reason why we are doing this is because we want to replace this T with L. You can see partial T partial Q dot is same as partial L partial Q dot. So we substitute that and then we simply have an equation with the Lagrangian function. An equation with the Lagrangian function which can be written in this form that is boxed here or this one that is colored in green with an equal sign equal to zero. This equation is very important. It is the one that we have been deriving all the time. So now that we know this, the next step is to learn how to use it. How do we use this equation? So that we can describe equation of motion of a system. If it is a pendulum, how do we get the equation of motion of a pendulum? If it is a mass oscillating on a spring, how do we get the equation of motion of mass on a spring? And so on. And if we have a complicated system, how do we apply the Lagrange's equation to write the equations of motion? So let's see how we can apply the Lagrangian on a simple system. This is a system that has a mass and a spring. The spring constant is K and the mass oscillates up and down uh, so X is the position of the mass at different points. So definitely X is a function of time and it can be differentiated with respect to time. So because the particle only oscillates up and down, the degrees of freedom is simply one, which is X. So Q, our generalized coordinate is simply X because the particle oscillates up and down. I could have said even Y. Okay, but the, the, the point remains that it is oscillating in one direction. So having said that, the kinetic energy therefore becomes half times m times x dot squared. Okay, because remember we have said that x is a function of time, so it can be differentiated. Now, the potential energy of a mass on a spring is expressed as half times the spring constant times x squared. So again, you see here that the potential energy is a function of position 
only. So now that we have the kinetic energy of the system and the potential energy, we can come and write the Lagrangian as total kinetic energy minus total potential energy. And this is what we have. We have kinetic energy, we have the potential energy. So we have the Lagrangian, and then we look at the Lagrangian equation. Let me go back to the previous slide. The Lagrangian equation, we have two, three terms that we need to differentiate first. We differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to position. We can, we will also differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to velocity. And then we will differentiate that function with respect to time. So this is exactly what we need to do here. We have obtained the Lagrangian as that. So we'd first differentiate it to this, with respect to velocity. And this is what you get. I'm sure you can agree that if you differentiate this with respect to velocity, x dot, this is what you will get. That expression, you then differentiate it again, but with respect to time. So differentiate this with respect to time. What happens is that now you'll have x dot dot. So that, that is what you get on the, on the first term. The second term, we differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to the position. And if we differentiate this with respect to position, you will simply get minus kx. So you have obtained everything you require from the Lagrangian equation. The next step is simply to substitute. The first term here is simply m times acceleration. Then the second term here is negative kx. So if you subtract the, a negative, it turns into positive. So you have x, kx. So this is the equation of motion of a mass on a spring. You will obtain the same equation if you use the Newtonian mechanics. Now, let me revisit a bit. What we said earlier is that the Lagrangian only uses the scalar, scalar, scalar functions, that is the kinetic energy and the potential energy, but the results obtained is the same, okay? So next, we need to apply Lagrangian in many systems so that we understand fully how it, it works. So I want you to try this question, okay? I want you to try using the Lagrangian and uh, see whether you can be able to understand at least a few things. So if you do that, in our next lecture, we will begin from here. We will look at what how you applied the Lagrangian equation, did you get the correct equation, and so on. So that if you have a difficulty, we will look at it, and then from there, you'll be more confident in handling more complicated systems. So this is for a simple pendulum, I want you to try it. It is the first thing we shall do next lecture. So that's all for this lecture. I hope you will be able to attend the next lectures. We are remaining with about three or four lectures to finish the whole course. And once it is done, when we resume from this holiday of COVID-19, uh, we'll, we'll go straight to the examination. So I would urge you to take these lectures very seriously. If you have a question, you can simply write to me through my email and or through your class representative, and then I will respond. So have a nice have a nice time. We'll meet next uh, week for next lecture. Bye bye.